What's going on everybody? Welcome to this episode of Home Built Workshop. Today is episode number two of our four string bass guitar build and we are working on the neck. We're going to get it mostly done. Stick around. Today we are continuing the bass guitar project. In a previous episode we made this body but we don't have a neck. So today we gotta build a neck. If you remember when I was preparing the mahogany stock for the body, I cut off a strip because the piece was just a little bit too wide. This piece is plenty wide enough to where we can resaw it, flip it on its side, glue it back together, and get a pretty cool neck blank. Let's do that. Before I resaw this piece, I'm gonna run it on the jointer with the side that I'm going to glue together down. This is just the same as jointing it bookmatch style, except it's one piece. And now with that freshly jointed edge down on my bandsaw table, I'm gonna resaw this piece right down the middle. Now if I lay my template onto my blank, it's a little bit too narrow. This is one measurement that I didn't check. Now I could very easily glue on an extra piece of mahogany right here at the corner where I need it and it wouldn't affect the neck at all. It'd work perfectly fine and is totally acceptable, but it's not the route that I wanna go for this build. I think for me, a better option is to glue up some pieces of hard maple as well as mahogany. I've just cut some thin strips here. We're gonna glue this down the center and that's gonna give us the extra width we need. Plus, it's gonna look cool as well. It's now gonna be a five piece laminated neck. Complicates the glue up just a tiny bit, but overall, not a big deal. Let's glue this. I'm using Tight Bond Original to glue these pieces together. It's really just a normal glue up, except now we have five pieces to apply the glue to instead of two or three. Now in a lot of cases, once you get a piece clamped up, you could probably use it after an hour, but I like to let guitar parts sit overnight when possible. After removing the piece from the clamps and running it through the drum sander to make sure it's nice and flat, here's our finished neck blank, ready to be cut out. I think this looks really cool and it's gonna make a really awesome looking neck. And now it's time to attach the neck template to the blank, being very careful to line up the center line of the blank with the center line of the template. And like I always like to do before I head to the bandsaw, I like to trace around the template with a pencil to give me a nice line that I can really closely follow at the bandsaw. And now we'll fire up the router with a flush trim template bit and route the blank flush with my template. At first I was running this bit a little bit too fast as I began getting some burning on the mahogany. Once I realized this, I slowed down the router and that cleaned things up quite a bit. Now I just have a bit more sanding to do to clean that up. Now at the drill press, I'm gonna mark the location of the tuners. I have the tuner locations marked on my template and I'm just gonna drill that same location into the headstock. I'll drill these out to the proper size a little later on. Now I'll use a center finding ruler to very carefully mark out a center line along the neck. I also transfer the center line to the heel of the neck. This is going to help us align the hole we need to drill for the truss rod. Then I'm going to attach this little jig to the heel of the neck. It's got a guide hole where I need to drill the access hole for the truss rod, as well as a hole that will guide me in the right position where I need to drill this other access hole. I just line up the center line on my guide block with the center line on my neck and stick it down with double-sided tape. I drill the hole on the heel end of the neck by hand because it won't fit in the drill press, but the hole on top, I use a Forstner bit at the drill press. Now I'm gonna use a block of wood to line up the end of the truss rod with the very end of the neck, and then I can mark the length of the truss rod. 
Now it's time to attach our truss rod routing jig. Now I've had a few questions about this jig recently and really this is about as unhigh tech as you can possibly get I think. I've seen a ton of different kinds of jigs and fixtures that people use, but really this is super, super simple and it works really well as long as you take your time when you're sticking it in place. It's just some half inch plywood with some rails glued on here that is the exact width of my router base. That way I can put the router in place and the rails keep it nice and straight. The slot I routed after I glued the rails down by just lowering the bit until I got a slot all the way through. Now I can just sight down through this slot, line it up as close as I possibly can with my center line, and we can route away. I do have an adjustable stop block at the end which lets me stop where the router is going to cut because, well, I don't want to cut all the way off the back of the neck, at least not with this style of truss rod. So I can adjust that. It's just a quarter 20 bolt running up through the slot with a wing nut so I can slide it into place, lock it down, and we're good to go. When I'm sticking it in place, I will line up the end of my truss rod with the end of the slot. That way the router's got a hard stop here. I'm not gonna route up into the headstock or route too far where the truss rod's gonna be able to slop around. So that is the end of the truss rod, and then I use the stop block at the end of the neck. Either way, I guess you could do it. You just have to adjust the stop block accordingly. I'm going to use this exact same jig when I cut the 8th inch slots for the carbon fiber rods. It doesn't really matter the bit size because the rails are what's going to hold the router nice and straight. So you can swap your bits out to whatever size you need and it's going to cut nice and straight as long as these rails are straight when you put the jig together. I'm going to use a cordless trim router for this. It works okay as long as you take slow cuts. I probably should use a little bit more powerful router, which I do have, but I need to either make a new jig to fit the new router or I need to make a new base plate to fit the other router. So whatever type of router you're using, just make sure to go slow, take small passes, make multiple cuts until you get down to the depth you need. Don't ever try to cut all at once. You're going to have a disaster. It's going to break the bit or mess up the cut, who knows, small passes, work your way down to the depth you need. And in case you're wondering, the bit that I'm using, this is a two flute, one quarter inch diameter, down cutting spiral bit. I found that the spiral bit seems to work a little bit better than one that has just a straight blade. I really like these spiral bits. I always keep a couple of them on hand at all times because, well, you just never know when you're gonna break one. And here you see me using a scrap of plywood that's the exact same thickness as the plywood that the jig is made from. I use that to slip over the bit. That way I can lay the truss rod on top and set it to the exact thickness that I need to route to. Now I'll move my jig over slightly and line it up on my lines for the 8th inch slot for the reinforcing rods. I'll swap out my router bits and route this 8th inch slot. For this router bit, I'm also using a two flute down cutting bit. This is another one that I keep several on hand because it's so small you just never know when one's going to break. And now let's see how everything fits. After a quick test fit, both the truss rod as well as the stiffening rods fit nice and flush to the neck. We're ready to move on to the fretboard. I've got a nice piece of rosewood here. We're going to mill this guy up into several fretboards, one of which will be for this base. I'm going to use the bandsaw to roughly cut this piece in half. And then I'll resaw this down into pieces that are just over a quarter inch thick. Once I have them all resawed, I'm going to run them through the drum sander to thickness them down to exactly a quarter of an inch. With the pieces at their final thickness, it's now time to attach the fretboard blank to the fret slotting jig. And I almost forgot one of the most important things, and that's a center line. Now we'll load up the jig, lock the fretboard in place, and we can start cutting fret slots. I 
I use this little gauge to check the depth of the fret slots, especially the first couple, because really I'm only cutting the nut slots and marking the end of the fretboard. So I make sure I get the depth correct before moving down the rest of the board. I'm mostly concerned with getting the depth right at the center of the fretboard because as we sand a radius on this later, we're going to lose a little bit of depth and we're going to have to fine tune these. But I want to get it as close as possible now. And now I guess we just tuck in and spend a few minutes sawing some slots. That's the last slot. Once you get this set up, it really doesn't take all that long, as nice as it would be to have some sort of saw already set up. Really, it takes only about 10 or 15 minutes to slot an entire fretboard. Now I'll trim the fretboard to length, leaving just a little bit extra that we can route away later. Now I'm gonna use a little bit of double-sided tape to temporarily mount the fretboard in place I'll drill a couple of small pilot holes, one through the very last fret slot and the other one through the nut slot. These will be used for some toothpick locating pins to keep the fretboard in place when we glue it down. With our little toothpick dowels all trimmed to size, I think we're ready for some glue. When it comes to gluing on the fretboard, a common practice is to tape off the truss rod channel, and this is to prevent glue from getting in the truss rod channel and causing the truss rod to somehow malfunction. While I don't think this is a bad practice, and I've actually done this on several builds myself, I'm not 100% sure that this is absolutely necessary because usually the tape gets removed before installing the fretboard. So when you clamp the fretboard in place, there's still a chance to get squeeze out whether you've taped it off or not. So what I like to do is just be cautious with my glue application to help avoid any glue getting in there. I usually just apply the glue a little bit lighter in the areas that are close to the truss rod in an effort to reduce squeeze out plugging up the truss rod channel. I want to hear from you guys though down in the comments section your thoughts on taping off the truss rod. Should you do it or not? After leaving the glue to dry overnight, it's back over to the bandsaw to trim off the excess fretboard as close as possible to the neck without nicking the neck with the blade. You have to be even more careful at this step than you do when you're trimming with your template. You don't want to nick the neck with your bandsaw blade. Now I need to thin the headstock down and to mark out where I need to cut it, I'm just going to use this little block of wood that has a pencil stuck in the side. This marks a line right around where I need to trim on the bandsaw. This is a really simple jig to create and once you have the pencil located at the exact measurement you need, you almost don't even have to measure anything. Now at the bandsaw I can remove that thin sliver of material. I'm cutting very carefully making sure to leave all of the pencil line. Now with the headstock roughly thinned out, we do have some bandsaw marks in there. We need to remove those as well as sand a nice transition up to the nut area on the fretboard. To do that, I'm going to use this jig on my oscillating spindle sander. Now you guys have seen me use this jig before, but I don't think I've really covered a whole lot of the details on this. It's not super technical, but I want to cover a few things on there in case you want to try to adapt something like this for your spindle sander or whatever sander you're really trying to adapt this to. So this whole jig is made from scraps of three quarter inch plywood. It just fits over the spindle on my spindle sander and I have a rail on the front that fits down in the groove on my particular sander. By having that rail on the front 
fit down in that slot. It keeps it nice and stable. If it does rattle for some reason, I can put some clamps on the ends just to kind of hold it in place. The way this jig works is this fence piece right here is hinged at the back and it can pivot this way. So I have a knob here with a threaded insert that I can adjust and it pushes on the back of this piece, which changes the thickness between the fence and the drum. That way I can set it for whatever thickness I want for the headstock. Of course, I have just some springs here to keep some tension on that. That way it always sits against the knob here when I make the adjustments. This little block on the front is really just a riser and it helps compensate for the taper in the neck as you're sanding. I wanna to try to keep the center line as level as possible when I'm sanding. So I just have some different heights here, whether I'm working on a left-handed neck or a right-handed neck, depending on which portion of the headstock is actually down on the table. I might at some point make something that's more adjustable, maybe has a knob down here so that I can adjust the height that way and I wouldn't have to have a block. But for now, the block's been working just fine. When you're sanding, a lot of the dust wants to accumulate right here. So I made this little contraption that holds the shop vac hose to try to collect as much of that dust as possible. Now, one downside of this jig is that this spindle is only about four and a half inches tall. So when I'm sanding a regular guitar neck, it just barely reaches to the end of the headstock. And really, it's not a big deal, but for this base neck, it's not gonna reach all the way across. So I'm gonna end up having to do this in two steps. I'm not super crazy about that idea, but we're gonna make it work. So what's gonna happen when I sand this is it's only gonna sand so high on the fretboard. It's gonna leave a ridge right here. We'll sand this down to the final thickness, and then we'll flip it over and I've got another block back here. I've just kind of taped it in place so that I can still try to keep my center line as vertical as possible. And then we'll come in from this way. Now that's not ideal either because the drum is rotating clockwise. So what could happen is it could grab the headstock and want to pull it into the drum. So I got to really be careful when we start sanding and maintain a nice steady even pressure so that it doesn't pull it out of my hands. In order to be able to make this work with this wider headstock, really I need taller drums. The issue with that is the stud that holds the rubber sanding sleeve is only so tall. So I either have to do some modifications to this or look for a different drum sander that takes the taller six inch drums. We're just gonna do this in two passes, sand it on one side, roughly down to final thickness, and then we'll flip it over and come in the other way. We're gonna end up with some little ridges in there because as the sander rotates and oscillates, it's gonna just leave some little sanding patterns in there. We can easily sand that out by hand using a sanding block, not really a big deal. And there you can start to see some of the ridges in the line created by the sanding drum. We're gonna sand those out here in a minute. With the headstock sanded nice and flat, we're now ready to go ahead and drill the tuner holes. Now to drill the tuner holes on a regular guitar, I have a special step drill bit that does that all in one shot. It works really slick. I don't have one specifically for the bass tuners, so we're gonna have to do this in two steps. We're gonna start out with a 14 millimeter drill bit and drill just deep enough so that the bushing will sit down in there. Then we'll switch to a 12 millimeter bit and using the center point left from the 14 millimeter bit, we're going to drill all the way through and that size will be for the tuner to fit up in. Then the bushing will have the step that it needs once we attach these to the headstock.
Nice. As we test fit the tuner, everything looks really good. Of course, it's not secured in the back yet by the little screw, but we're not at that point yet. We're not ready to drill those holes. I think we're gonna end this video here, guys, mainly because the very next step, I need to route the recess here for my logo. In order to do that, I've gotta build a whole entire new jig to accommodate this different size headstock. And I wanna share that with you guys. I don't wanna just speed through it as part of this build because I got a couple things that I wanna share with you that might help you out with a project of yours. So make sure if you're not already subscribed to the channel, you hit that subscribe button, ring that notification bell so that you get notified when the next episode comes out. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this. We got a little ways to go, but overall our neck it's coming along nicely. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. We'll see you next time. <laughs> That's for you, Chris. <laughs> it's a little chillier today, so I had to break out the sweatshirts. Oh no, that means winter's coming. Inside joke.